Welcome to part two of this interview. I have a question for you. So what about age? When someone gets older and they don't have a regular income like they had when they were younger, what, it, what is it that they need to have to be able to do refinances or to purchase a property if they haven't bought one in a couple of years? Welcome to the Jennifer J. Hammond Podcast. Jennifer is a licensed realtor, educator, speaker, and best-selling author. Jennifer's goal is to help you find your yay in every day. I have a question for you. So what about age? When someone gets older and they don't have a regular income like they had when they were younger, what it, what is it that they need to have to be able to do refinances or to purchase a property if they haven't bought one in a couple of years? I'm going to ask you to be more specific, but, um, you know, for example, there is a loan program out there called a reverse mortgage. Yeah. Remember that old school term reverse mortgage? And a lot well, of people I, cringe at that one. <laughs> yes. Yes. They cringe at it because of the evolution of that loan program over the last, are we dating ourselves? Over, I know. The, last, over the last 20 years. 20 years. Yeah. Just. I could go back further, but I'm just going to go 20. Over the last 20 years, that product itself has, has evolved in a tremendous way. But if you were, if you were around 50, 10, 15, 20 years ago, you kind of cringe when you heard it because why would I ask my parents to consider that mortgage? And now we're no longer are considering that for our parents. But as we get older now, it's us that's making that consideration. And so a reverse mortgage is using the equity within the property to make your mortgage payments on a monthly basis. So that's one option. If someone else is growing in age and they're looking to purchase a home, but they have limited income sources, again, that's where a good lender conversation should take place. There are loan programs that are available and if there aren't any available at this present time, then a plan can be put in place how to achieve that over three, six, 12 months, respectively, so that we just don't leave people in the dark. Yeah, We've got to educate the, the public, the home buying public on what's out there. And when we do, guess what happens? They people. make better choices. Yeah. Voila. Yeah, they do. They do. And I, you are the biggest endorser of the team concept. And so having a knowledgeable real estate agent, a knowledgeable lender, a knowledgeable financial advisor, a knowledgeable title person, title company. I mean, having that team as it pertains to real estate not one single person in and of themselves is capable of providing everything that a prospective or home buyer needs. I agree. I agree. You need everybody. And even when they disagree, that's when you get to decide what's right yes. for you because they're not all going to be the same. And, and that's something that is okay as well. Yes. I talk about it as the yay team. Everybody on your team should help you say, yay. Yeah. Yeah. Because and I when I first got on radio so, so many years ago, I used to call it the A team. And then I, I changed it to the yay team because everybody <laughs> on your team should help you say yay. Your mortgage person, your real estate person, everybody, your attorney, they mm -hmm. should all help you. And again, they may all give you different pieces of advice and you have to kind of sort through and figure out which one is going to be the right one for you and for you at this time. Because again, it changes. And it's one of the reasons yeah. your team should be people that you have, that you keep going on and on and on. And it's, it's a team that evolves over life. And when you have the major changes in your life, and I want to say changes because it could be a death, it could be a divorce, it could be a marriage, it could yes. be a birth, it could be the birth yeah. of a child. You need to be able to talk to your mortgage person and say, hey, so is there something I could be looking at or is there something I could do differently? Or Because it's a, you know, mortgage is a, just a financial instrument. It's a it it's is. thing to 
help you, you know, be able to have home ownership. So how can we do that? How can we utilize it? Well, it's by learning all the different products and figuring out which one is best for you. And that's one of the reasons I say, if you're listening to this and even the mortgages don't apply to you, think about who they might apply to and who could also benefit from knowing that there's a USDA loan that's zero down or an investor loan that doesn't have, you don't have to worry about, you know, your tax returns. Because again, I know investors don't always, their tax returns are complicated. And, you know, there was always that kind of who's interpreting my tax returns because the yeah. tax code is so confusing. And, but knowing that the, the money is out there, there is plenty of money, you know, there's not a scarcity. I think that's one thing that happens a lot is they, people start to get that idea. There's a yeah. scarcity and I'm not going to be able to get money to buy a bunch of real estate investing properties and, and know what that is and be able to understand all the, the differences and the nuances. It's so important to be knowledgeable and to have your it, team members talk to each other. It is. And Jennifer, today, I mean, we talked about investors, which I think are increasing in our marketplace. We talked a little bit about how the inventory levels are very low. And so there are more buyers fighting for properties at higher prices. But one of the other things I definitely think we should make mention of today is that I see a, an increase of self-employed now post-COVID. Yeah. I'm calling I'm calling it post-COVID. Yes. Um, it's done. It's, it's done. Yes. It's it's done. To existence. Yes, it's it's done. So with that being said, Jennifer. There's a lot of self-employed borrowers out there. And you talk, we talk about building that yay team. They go to their CPA or fin and financial advisors and they get communication and information on how to do their tax returns this way. And then they do their tax returns this way. And then they come to the mortgage lender and they say, hey, look, here are my tax returns. And here's all my financial information. And I want to qualify for this house. And the lender says, oh, you don't really have an income here. And they go like, well, I did. I made this much. But you wrote off this much. And well, this is what in my communications with my CPA that is best for my business. Great. And again, where you spoke a minute ago about not everyone on that team always having the same answer because there are different perspectives. Now me or us in the lender world, I'm, I'm not just speaking of me right now in Security National Mortgage. I'm speaking of loan officers across the United States. We then are placed into a situation where you go like, uh-oh, your tax returns don't show enough income for you to qualify to buy this house. Yeah. Now, depending upon who that bank or mortgage company is, they may not have an answer. So if they were talking to us, we have an answer. We have a bank statement loan for self-employed borrowers where they provide 12 to 24 months of bank statements. We analyze those very carefully and we come up that based upon business deposits, we look at their and annualize and, and we put together an income average. Voila. Voila. It works. It works. And we have documented paperwork. <clears throat> Whereas years ago, you didn't have that. And so here we now have a bank statement program where we have 12 to 24 months of their business bank statements, whether they're a sole proprietor, a partnership, an LLC, or a corporation. And we annualize, we, and I say annualize, we evaluate those business deposits over that 12 to 24 month period, come up with a monthly income. We make sure that their credit score is also in line with the credit qualifications for that program. And we can then provide them a loan. And guess what? They don't have to go back to their CPA and try to figure out how to change those tax returns. Because if that's the kind of business they're running and they're meeting the IRS codes, they've got to make a decision. Do I want to purchase this home under this bank statement program or do I? No, 
again, presenting them with all the options gives them an educated ability to make a decision. Yeah, and that's the thing is, is just understanding what are the options for people so that they feel really comfortable, you know, making a decision, a good decision. Again, I'm always interested in people making a good decision for themselves, yes. um, given whatever their situation is at this time, because every time in your life is going to be a little bit different. And so make sure you have open communication. And that's one thing I wanted to touch on. I already, I got one question um, through one of the things. So I have a question for you in a minute, but one, and I wanted to tell anybody who's in the room, feel free to raise your hand if you've got questions. Also, if you're watching us live on one of the other channels, feel free, you can message me. I, I do have one message uh, already. But one thing that I find is that sometimes people are afraid to communicate, especially when it comes to money. So Scott, what would you say to someone who is sitting there thinking, I don't know, I don't, you know, I'm ashamed of, you know, something or I'm afraid of the answer, I think is also part of the reason. But just also because a lot of people, you know, it, it's cultural in different cultures, you just don't talk about money. And yeah. so unfortunately, that keeps people from knowing and having the information they need to be able to make good decisions in, I want to say in real estate and finances and money, anything to do with it. So what would you say to someone who is a little bit afraid to communicate about money? Sure. The first thing I would say, Jennifer, is I understand. Yeah. I really do. I understand. Think about this for a second. And I know people are listening, but let's think about that, you and I, Jen, for a second. So someone's going to look at my credit history. Someone's going to look at my bank statements. Someone's going to see my pay stubs. I'm totally exposed. Naked. Naked. <laughs> like, really, really, really. And so as a lender, with the understanding that that is a very vulnerable position to be in, both personally and professionally, you're dealing with folks just like yourself, because you're no different. You've got to be able to communicate that right up front. Hey, Mr. Mrs. Jones, um, um, I, this is the information and the documentation I need in order to see how much of a loan you qualify for. If you have any questions, I'm totally available. And Mr. or Mrs. Jones, please understand, there's not any question that you can ask me. As I go through your credit report, I'm going to give you a call. We're going to go line by line. We're going to go through each item. I'm going to make sure they're legitimate first and foremost. And then we're going to go through them and see if there's anything that's not accurate so that you and I can be on the same page. And getting them to understand by sincerity and authenticity that you are not there just to do a transaction. You're there to help them buy a home, build a legacy. And that is not always said verbally, but that has to be communicated without being communicated. Because people can tell when you're sincerely caring about what they are doing and they're exposing themselves to you. And by the way, prior to them making that phone call to you, prior to them, you reaching out to them, they didn't know you. So they're in a very vulnerable position. So I've got to bring them home very quickly to a level of comfort so that they understand, hey, look, I'm here to help. Absolutely. So well said. Very well said. <laughs> it actually dovetails into my question that I, I got um, uh, asked to ask you, and that is about credit scores. And yeah. so with the credit score, obviously, there's a difference between someone who is an investor versus someone who perhaps is a first time home buyer. But one thing I've also seen is people who have a really high credit score, but they don't have the right kind of credit on their credit report. Does mm -hmm. it make sense? It like does. they haven't, you know, they haven't had long relationships. They're brand new, like they're brand new. So they might have an 800 score, but they don't really have, like they might only have a bank account and one credit card or something like that. So how does the credit report play in um, to your decision for a mortgage? It plays into every decision because um, I, <laughs> I keep saying this, but there are programs that are um, 
backed by the government, mm -hmm. uh, whether they be conventional, FHA, Federal Housing Administration, or VA, Veterans Administration, USDA, Rural Development. So everything is related to a credit score or a credit report, potentially. When these loans are serviced by a government entity or an investor that is responsible, let me rephrase that, but these loans are serviced by an investor that is responsible for making sure they adhere to those government agency guidelines. So with that being said, someone comes and they have a credit, they have, they have questions, they have a great credit score, but they only have one. Well, you know, Fannie and Freddie actually give some flexibility to someone with only one credit score. That wasn't always the case years ago. That wasn't the case, but they do now. And in some cases, depending upon the length of time, if someone comes in and they have no credit score, do you know that there are programs available to someone with no credit score? No, really? I didn't know. <laughs> no credit score? Wow. So, so with no official credit score, then we can look at alternative sources of credit. You mean like that would be somebody who's a foreign national who has no credit? Or is no. it a first time home buyer? First time home buyer. Really? Wow. Yeah. Oh, that's so, crazy. I mean, again, the education piece is so critical. Mm -hmm. Once you start to have that conversation and getting that level of comfort established with that potential home buyer and getting them to let their guard down and communicating sincerely and with authenticity and saying, okay, I understand exactly what you're saying here. Let me help you. Oh, can I look at, can I get back to you? I'm gonna check a few guidelines. You, you check the guidelines, you come back and you say, guess what? There are some loan programs that are available for you with no credit score, but this is the route you have to take. These are some of the things we have to do. We've gotta check a cell phone bill. We gotta check your insurance. Uh, history for the last 12 months. We got to check your rent history for the last 12 months, things of that nature. Yeah. And so being able to have a yay team, folks that are knowledgeable, whether they work for a bank, work for a mortgage company, it still has to be someone who's knowledgeable that can look at a situation and make and help make wise decisions. Yeah. And that's, a, that's part of it is being able to look across it. And that's one of the reasons I want to bring it up is that people often are so afraid of, well, I'm just not going to. And I think it, it kind of goes back to, again, that they've listened to the wrong people and the people who are not experts <laughs> having a conversation about credit, credit scores, or talking to somebody about mortgages who don't understand mortgages and all the different flexibility there is for mortgages because there's there's mortgages out there. And it, again, it depends on what your goals are, whether you're a real estate investor, whether we wanna be a primary residence, what is your goal there? But if you don't communicate it, which is one of the reasons I wanted to bring up communication. Um, I've recently found, one thing I found, which you might have, It'd be interesting to know if your team has had this experience as well. I think it's interesting with my clients, every so often, some clients just default down to text messaging. <laughs> and that is not always good communication, right? Yes, yes, yes. So things can go a little bit awry if we're not communicating well. And yet it's interesting um, and just specifically, can I throw something in there? I yeah, heard a I heard a I heard a conversation the other day. Young man was talking to someone, and and he asked the person on the uh, as a phone call. He had received the phone call for someone, and he goes, "May I ask you a question? How old are you?" And the person on the person on the other side of the phone call said, "Well, I'm forty something," and the young man said, "Oh, now that makes sense because you know." People my age only text these days. We don't do phone calls. And so, again, you got to reach them where they are. Yeah. So SMS, text messaging, we've made our systems. We've adjusted our system so that we can reach the buyer public that likes text messages. Yeah. 
And that seems to be the way uh, and the culture that we're moving in. But I didn't mean to cut you off. Yes. No, and I agree. And that's, I've seen that with so many of my clients as well. And and it just really, it's sometimes it's not the best communication. And so my, my point of that also is just pick up the phone and have a conversation <laughs> and don't be afraid of the full conversation because- sure. It's not always easy to get good communication in text messages, <laughs> sites, you know, it's like, just, just take the time to, to really ask the questions. Okay. So I wanted to ask, um, I know John, John Lee's there and John, you were, um, you always seem to have great questions. I was hoping you might have a question for Scott today. Oh, uh, sure. Thank, thanks, Jennifer. Uh, great stuff, Scott. Always good to hear about mortgages. That's uh, one of my dirty things I love is financing. <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> I just got maybe two quick questions. First thing, I was wondering how long does it t is it taking in like underwriting right now from somebody that's fairly good. I know there's always things that come up, but from start to finish, if somebody brought you pretty much a complete um, set of facts today about how long would it take? And the other thing, I was just wondering, if you had anything that was, uh, I know some people try to maybe not disclose everything, and I don't want to say they purposely hide stuff, but maybe they might forget something major. If you had anything that kind of sticks out that. Uh, might be a little unusual. So thanks. And that's, that's, it. that's it. John, thanks for your questions. I, I think I actually can handle those questions. They're not too difficult for me. So John, I appreciate that. Um, the first one being we can generally close a loan and it's pretty much within the industry for most folks, but there are some uh, anomalies out there. But from start to finish, if someone is purchasing a home, or even refinancing a home and they write a contract and go to closing, that's generally done within 30 days. Can you do it in two weeks? Absolutely. Can you do it in three weeks? Absolutely. But definitely within 30 days. That should be, I would think, that should be standard in our industry right now. And there are some people who are saying it takes six weeks. Um, so it is good. But, you know, as you know, it depends on whether it's a bank. Can you, can they call me, please? If they, if it's taking them six weeks, yeah, just tell them to call me. Union or certain places, it does, oh, yeah. it does definitely take longer. And that's uh, that's the reason it is a very good question for anyone who's listening. That the timing part of it also can make or break you if you're yeah. in a competitive situation and a seller wants to sell fast versus not fast. So. That's correct. That's correct. And then uh, John's second question, um, when you have that initial conversation as a lender, when you have that initial conversation with a home buyer, someone looking to purchase a home or someone who already owns a home and think about refinancing, you always communicate your checklist of documents needed up front. And you make it clear, if you give me or get to me these items, this will be a smooth process. And there's always times that the checklist is given up front and it should always be given up front and make it clear, if you get these to me within the next 48 hours, 72 hours, we're gonna have, we're gonna be able to roll through this process. If there's something on that checklist, a bank statement, or a pay stub or something that they're concerned about, that question by the lender should always be asked. Do you have any questions or things that concern you right now at the beginning of this process regarding your credit report, history, your pay stubs, your income, your bank statements? Are you getting a gift? Is there anything that concerns you at all? And that way, if that question is asked up front, guess what happens? You can't. It'll, yeah. Out. It eliminates a lot of problems down the road. Yeah. Yeah. And again, you're establishing a comfort level. Um, going back to one thing else, Jennifer, I talk about playing in the sandbox, playing outside the sandbox. You are a realtor that does both. You know the normal guidelines, the traditional guidelines with all the traditional programs, VA, FHA, conventional, USDA. You understand that, but you then also understand because you deal with a lot with investors and things that don't normally fit a box, you know how to play outside the sandbox. So it's very critical, I think critically important that home buyers understand 
who they're aligning themselves with to purchase a home and work with to establish that relationship. It's not about, are we doing anything illegal or not up to code or meeting the guidelines? It really is just providing you an opportunity as a home buyer with all of the options so that you can make wise decisions about the biggest investment you're gonna have in life. Absolutely. And so Jennifer, you are in the box and you're out of the box, the sandbox. And I think it's really important to explain that to people because understanding that, you know, as a real estate investor, we think very differently than yeah. a real estate agent, um, or I should say than, than like the traditional home buying process and understanding even like one of the, the classes I've actually taught and I love teaching is when you're deciding to interview a real estate agent or like each person who's on your team, if you're gonna hire, and you and I have done similar shows on this, I have my 17 questions that I- <laughs> Yes, you do. <laughs> your mortgage person when you are interviewing them. And I say mortgage person because maybe it's a bank, maybe it's a credit union, you yeah. know, maybe it's a mortgage company like what Scott has, and Scott's done this with me, go through the 17 questions and we really, we dig deep so that you understand the point of the questions is to have a conversation. Yes. I have had people, and I think you probably even know one of these. I have had people who have emailed over the 17 questions and said, hey, fill this out and send it back. I'm like, there wasn't right or wrong answers to these questions. They were part of a conversation. Yes. You guys really get to know each other. This yes. wasn't about uh, you get an A or you get a B or you get a failing grade on this right. set of questions. It's about opening up communication so that there aren't surprises for from anybody. And I think that's really critical and so often overlooked. And the, the text message um, example I used with... Um, with certain clients, they just they just keep text messaging, and I, I it breaks my heart a little bit because I realize that they're missing out on so much communication because they keep just rushing through and thinking they got it all handled by text communication, and that's not true, especially when it comes to their money, their finances, and mortgages. So, I, I just you know I am so grateful to you, Scott Shelton. Thank you so much for coming on and for for always being so willing to talk about the different mortgages, what's happening in the market. So I'm gonna end with my last question is, what is your prediction for 2022? What do you see happening? Interest rates going up, more products, less products. What do you see for mortgages? Um, can I ask you a question real quickly? Do you want the economist view or the Scott Shelton view? I want the Scott Shelton view. <laughs> I think we're still going to have a great year. Yeah. I really do. I know we have inventory issues. Um, I know that we have in some certain markets, higher appreciation rates taking prices taking place. But that all being said, I believe that we have a great real estate market and we have an out of balance whack right now with supply and demand. We have a lot of home buyers with very few properties and people want to buy homes and people want to move up and people want new construction. So with that being said, we're going to have a fantastic 2022. So hold on. Hold on. I think that's a perfect way to do it. Well, again, thank you so much for being with us. I always appreciate you. I appreciate your, all of your experience, your 30 years. You don't look like you've been at 30 years. You're so young. <laughs> Anybody's watching us on YouTube, you can see Scott. So if you're listening, go ahead and go to YouTube. You can see Scott. And so Scott, I know you get, uh, go ahead and give them your information really fast. Um, if they sure. want to contact you and find out more about getting a mortgage. with your Sure. I, I guess the best way to start would be my email address. That would be the best way. And then email me and then I'll give you a phone call. So the email address is Scott, S-C-O-T-T -T dot Shelton, S H. E L T O N at S for security, N for national, M for mortgage, C for corporation. So SNMC.com, Scott.Shelton at SNMC.com. 
Perfect. Thank you so much, Scott. And I appreciate all that you do. And I, I just want to say the one thing that we do at the end is I have John and anyone else who wants to come off their mics. And as you know, I always ask you to raise your voice and say yay with me as we go off the air. Okay? Three, two, one. Yay! yay. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jack Canfield. You may know me as the co-author of the Chicken Soup for the Soul series. And if you want more help in getting from where you are to where you want to be, I want to encourage you to listen to the Jennifer Hammond Show.